Today, what we will be doing is uh, I'm going to show you the thought process on doing a titration curve and um, explain to you how to calculate the pH on the different stages when you add uh, titrant. Okay, so um, this activity scheduled for today, uh, you don't have to complete it until uh, Friday. Uh, on Wednesday, we do have a midterm quiz. It's only worth 75 points. I, I say only 75, but um, yeah, that's, that's a bunch. Let me just show you where that's found in um, Canvas. What you guys will do is, uh, We'll probably, we can begin as early as 6.30, even though we meet at 6.45, and then uh, it'll close at 10 on Wednesday. Um, once you open it, I believe I give you like 90 minutes. Let me just check, because I'm getting my um, different midterms mixed up these days. So this, let me um, pull that out in the, um, canvas and share that with you. It's about. So I want to draw a picture and introduce you to the different uh, aspects of the uh, titration. Usually what you are doing is you are analyzing a chemical and that chemical is called the analyte. And generally that chemical, you don't know the concentration. And so when you do a titration, that's your goal is to figure out what that concentration is. In this particular case, you will know the concentration. What you want to do is you want to generate a titration curve. So that's your analyte. Uh, what you can do is you can have a pH meter here. OK. And the pH meter will give you a reading of the pH at various stage of your titration. And then of course you have your titrant and the titrant is generally in a burette. And you guys saw this because you guys saw that experiment that was scheduled before spring break. So what we're going to do is we're gonna put a base here and that has a known concentration And you have your analyte here, and that has um, a known volume, OK? And what you guys are going to be doing is you're going to open up the stopcock, and you're going to be adding the titrant into the analyte. And if this is acidic, in the presence of a base, that chemical will be less acidic. So when you start off, the pH is going to be pretty low depending on the identity of the acid. Sometimes it'll be um, 1.0 if it's a one molar strong acid. Sometimes it'll be like two or three depending on the identity of the acid. But your titration curve is gonna look like this. It's gonna start out low. It's going to level off. We call this the buffer region. And right before the, remember that the equivalence point is where the moles of your base equals the moles of your acid. That's the equivalence point. The end point is where you have a visual of when to stop or um, a visual of when the moles Most of base equals most of acid because of either the pH meter indicates that it's now gone from acidic solution to basic solution, or the indicator has changed color. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to measure the equivalence point because at the equivalence point, we know the equivalent volume, that is, how much of the titrant we've added 
so that the moles of the acid equals the moles of the base. So this is what the titration curve will look like. It'll, once it's very close to the equivalence point, then we get a sharp rise on the pH. Okay, so that's one. This is a, a another titration curve, and I'll do dots here. And you notice how this thing goes up early on and then sort of levels off. Like that. I can tell just based on the um, shape of the titration curve that this is probably a strong acid analyte. How do I know that? Because the pH doesn't change very dramatically early on. You start low, which means that you have a high concentration of hydronium, and then it doesn't change very much, and then you hit the equivalence point, okay? And the reason why I know that this is a somewhat strong acid analyte is because for these types of system, you don't have a buffer region. Okay, when you have a strong acid, strong base titration, you don't have a buffer region. Whereas this, this is probably a, um, this is probably a weak acid. Titration. What happens is that the pH changes dramatically early on because the hydronium ion concentration is going to be decrease substantially early on because you're putting in a strong base. But then you get to this leveling off right here and that's the buffer region. Okay, that's the buffer region. And then of course you hit the equivalence point. What you wanna do is you wanna find the, the where the slope goes from positive. Positive would be like a slope like that to negative and a slope that looks like that. So where does, <coughs> excuse me. Where the slope goes from positive to negative, that's your inflection point, and that's probably the equivalence point. Okay, and at that point, you can read the volume. We call that the equivalent volume. So, what is in this axis is the volume of titrant. Okay, that's this guy right here. And this axis is your pH, it measures pH. So it gauges the acidity concentration of your analyte. So that's what the experiment is about, or what your calculation is about, is uh, you guys are gonna be adding titrant, the pH is going to change over time as you make that solution less acidic, now the solution will reach the equivalence point where the moles of your acid is equal to the moles of the base that you've added. And then after that, the majority of the chemical is going to be your titrant. So the solution is going to be basic. And that's what you see right here, okay? Um, in a strong acid, strong base, titration, it, the titration curve will always go through seven. Okay, it'll always go through seven at the halfway mark. Why? Because in a strong acid, strong base, let's say, say we have um, HNO3 and NaOH, and we reach the equivalence point. At the equivalence point, this moles is equal to this moles. So when those two moles are equal, what you have is water, of course. You've got sodium and nitrate. Now, remember we talked about salts in lecture. For those of you not in my lecture, then um, that's one of the topics that you cover in acid-base chemistry. The, these ions come from strong base, strong acid. And because they come from a strong base, strong acid conjugate, then they're not gonna react further in water, which means that the pH is not gonna change. 
And the pH is not going to change when, when these chemicals are in solution at the equivalence point, then that means the pH is dictated by the, um, the, the auto dissociation of water. Remember water auto dissociates in the tune of two waters, goes to hydronium ion concentration plus hydroxide. And at 25 degrees, then the KW equals one times 10 to the minus 14. And the pKW equals 14, which means that the hydronium ion concentration is 1 times 10 to the minus 7. So in a strong acid, strong base, your equivalence point is always going to have a pH of 7. Even if your base is stronger than your acid, because what happens at the equivalence point is that the moles are going to end up the same. You're going to add enough titrant so that the moles of the base that you added is equal to the moles of your acid. At that point, there is no excess hygiene ion. There is no excess hydroxide ion. They form water. The conjugates, the nitrates, and the sodium will not do anything in water. So uh, for strong acid, strong base system, what, what you need to do is the following. Okay, the first thing that you need to do when you have zero titrant added, so zero uh, base, okay, you just have to look at the acid, figure out the concentration, and because it's a strong acid, if that chemical has a 0 0.105 molar concentration, then that is also equal to the hydronium ion concentration. And in order to get the pH for that, you just take the negative log of your 0 0.105 molar um, concentration of your acid, because all your acid will dissociate by definition, because it's a strong acid. So, so that would be your first point. That would be your first point in your titration curve is whatever the negative log of the uh, titrant concentrate, uh, the analyte concentration is. Now, what happens is that you're going to start adding sodium hydroxide. When you start adding sodium hydroxide, a certain amount of the acid is going to get neutralized. But there will still be an excess amount of acid. That excess amount of acid that hasn't reacted with the base is going to dictate the pH of the solution. So let's say that I have, let's say I have HCl here. And let's, for instance, say we have 100 moles of that. And to that, we add, say, sodium hydroxide. So the reaction would look like this, HCl plus NaOH. I'm just using HCl because that's one of our seven strong acid. You could easily use sulfuric acid, nitric acid, perchloric acid. I'm using HCl. And this thing, when the reaction is done, it's going to form water. And NaCl aqueous. So if we have 100 moles of this, OK? Uh, when we have moles and we know the total volume, then we can get molarity. And why do we need molarity? Because it's the molarity of the hydronium ion concentration that gives us our pH. So let's just say we have 100 moles of this. And let's say that we add 25 moles of sodium hydroxide. What you need to do is you need to work out the stoichiometry first. Why? Because these things are going to react stoichiometrically. Don't think about equilibrium when you have strong acid, strong base system. There, there is no equilibrium. That's why I said in lecture, you guys are on your own on this because you can figure it out based on what you learn in 152 and 200. Okay, so this is our start. When the reaction occurs, so this is what we call our SRF table, unlike our ICE table. Okay, SRF means that it's stoichiometric. The reaction will be based on the limiting reagent, 25 
And of course, you're going to form 25 here and 25 here. But you don't have to worry about these products here because what you want to do is figure out how much hydrochloric acid was unreactive. So when you finish, if you start with 100 and you um, 25 of it reacted because that's how much base you've added, then you have 75 moles unreacted of that strong acid. What you want to do is you want to take that 75 moles and divide it by the total volume so that you can get a concentration. And that's it. You don't have to do anything else. You can take that concentration, take the negative log of that concentration, and that'll get you your pH. It's not difficult when you have a strong acid, strong base system. What you need to do is you need to figure out which chemical is the excess. And then from that excess, calculate how much uh, moles re remains divided by the total volume because the concentration is going to change because when you're doing this titration, this volume is constantly changing. Okay, this volume is constantly changing. So you always got to divide it by the total volume. The amount that you started with plus the volume that you've added during the titration. If you added five mils and you start with 20, so the total volume is 25. If you add an additional 10, then the total volume now goes from 25 to 30. Uh, to 30. Okay, so that's that's the strong acid, strong base situation. What happens, of course, is that when you reach the equivalent point, so th this now is 100 moles, and this is 100 moles, then the water that you form is also 100 moles, and the sodium hydrochloride that you form is also 100 moles, these guys are not important in the, in the product. Why? Because they don't really do any acid-based chemistry. So that's your start, that's your react, that's your finish. So your limiting is 100. So it looks like you have nothing. Zero, zero. This is 100. This is 100. But these don't give you any pH value. It's these guys. Uh, hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide, but they're zero. So how can you calculate a hydronium ion concentration or hydroxide? You can't, but now because you've got water, the pH is determined by the uh, auto ionization of water, which will be a pH of seven. That's why it has to go through seven because both acids and base react completely and all you have is water to dictate the pH. Now, suppose you're past the equivalence point. So we have HCl here, and we have sodium hydroxide here. And let's say that now I've added 125 moles of sodium hydroxide. So again, it's good. these things are always stoichiometric. That's why I'm using SRF versus ICE. ICE is for equilibrium. SRF is for stoichiometry. Start, react, finish. That's the way I learned it. I don't think, I don't know if your book does it, but um, it, it makes sense to me. So let's say that this is 125 moles. Your hydrochloric acid is still 100. Now, notice that I'm always using what I started with. I don't continue on from where I end up in the last problem. I always go back to the basic. This is what I started with, 100 moles of HCl. Now I'm adding 125 moles sodium hydroxide. The limiting reagent now is your hydrochloric acid. That's the amount that's going to get you up first. And I'm not even going to worry about what's on that other side because it's not important. So the reaction is, this is zero no acid, but this is 25. So if we have 25 moles excess sodium hydroxide, because we've, we've, we're have we over the equivalence point, then what you need to do is you need to take 25 moles and divide it by the total volume. The volume is constantly increasing because you're slowly adding titrant during the process. So that volume is going to be much bigger than this volume in the beginning. So um, just take your total volume. And <clears throat> what you want to do, of course, is calculate the hydroxide ion concentration, 
because that's coming from your high sodium hydroxide. From your hydroxide ion concentration, you can get the negative log, and that'll get you your pOH. And just subtract 14 from that to get the pH. So that's the titration of a strong acid with a strong base. Pretty straightforward. It's all stoichiometric. Don't look for an equilibrium constant. Let's look at the titration of a weak acid with a strong base. So we're looking at a, for a weak acid with a strong base. We are never going to do a calculation where we titrate a weak acid with a weak base. The reason why we don't do that is because you can control the titrant. If you can control the titrant, why make it more harder for yourself by using a weak titrant? You want to use a strong titrant, strong base, because then you can predict the chemistry that initially occurs. Okay, so this is what happens dur during this type of titration. Again, you're going to have your analyte here, except your analyte now is a weak acid and your burette is going to contain your titrant, and your titrant now is going to have a strong base, sodium hydroxide again, okay, or potassium hydroxide. Doesn't matter, but you're going to have a base in which you can control the concentration, and if you know the volume, you can ca calculate the, um, the moles that you've added. So initially, when you do this titration, your first value here, your first point is just the pH of that analyte. Well, if you haven't added any titrant, then that's just the pH of a weak acid. What is the pH of a weak acid? Here's the shortcut. You guys know that if you have a weak acid and you know the Ka, then you can do this equation. The hydronium ion concentration is equal to the square root of the Ka times the initial concentration of your acid. That's the shortcut that I've been trying to, that I've taught you guys now. And that comes from the ice table. When, when you set up the ice table and you solve for hydronium, okay, because the hydronium and the conjugate of HA are the same, since they're the same, that's x squared. That's why you have a square root right there. This right here is just that point right there. Okay. The hydronium ion concentration is equal to the square root of the Ka of that weak acid times the initial acid concentration. And that point will be the negative log of your hydronium ion concentration. And it will be somewhat higher. Uh, just because it's a weak acid, okay? It'll be uh, generally above one because it's a weak acid. So that's your first point. S straightforward, you guys should be able to figure that out, okay? You know, you know how to solve for weak acids. How about your second point? Well, your second point, what happens now, and let me try and make sure I draw a picture so you can visualize the chemistry that's occurring, okay? Once you start adding base, then what happens is that your acid and your hydroxide are going to react. Now, because the hydroxide is a strong base, that's stoichiometric. Yes, you got a weak acid, but the strong base dictates that that weak acid, that puny acid better give up its hydrogen because that strong base is going to demand it, okay? So this is what happens. The, you, you're gonna form water and you're going to form some conjugate of that acid. And that's what happens. Uh, the first is an SRF because it's going to be stoichiometric. And then what you need to do is realize that, okay, I now know what the concentrations are after the initial stoichiometry. Then I can start applying the equilibrium concept. So what happens here is that your acid 
is going to react with your base. But let's say we have 100 of these, OK, 100 moles. Again, you have to keep track of the volume because the volume, the moles divided by the volume is your concentration. Say we have 100 of these, and let's say we just added, say, 25 hydroxide, 25 moles of hydroxide. OK, what happens, of course, is that, and these are zeros. OK, these are zeros. So the reason why it's stoichiometric is because the hydroxide is going to demand that 25 of the acid gives up its hydrogen. So 25, 25 plus 25 plus 25. I'm not worried so much about the water because again, that never shows up in the mass action expression, but I am concerned about that. That's important because the um, amount of acid that gets neutralized by the base now becomes a conjugate, now becomes the conjugate, okay? So uh, whatever gets used up in the beginning shows up as a product. So this will be 75, this will be, this will be zero. Don't worry about that. And this is 25 right there. Guess what? We have a common ion effect now, okay? Why do we have a common ion? Because in the process of neutralizing some of the acid, we form the conjugate, and the conjugate is common ion of the, of the acid, okay? So we can do the ice table now. We can do the ice table. So we go from SRF to ICE, where we have HA plus water goes to H3O plus, because what's going on here is that you have some of your acid converting over to the conjugate, you don't have any more base because your hydroxide has chewed up 25 moles of your acid. So these are the two that are going to be in solution, the, the acid and its conjugate. And what happens, of course, is that these, this, this chemical, the acid, because it's an acid, wants to donate its hydrogen to water. From this point on, the weak acid is going to react with water via our classic acid-based chemistry for weak acid problem. And then, of course, this is going to be A minus. So our initial would be 75 divided by the total volume. You need to put the total volume here because ice table requires molarity. SRF requires moles. So here we need molarity. But here we, we deal with moles because it's stoichiometry. So we need a total volume. OK, uh, don't worry about water. This will be 0. This, however, because of this, will be 25. It's not 0. It's not 0. Hydronium is zero because it hasn't auto dissol it hasn't reacted with water yet. Okay. Then we have our change my minus x plus x plus x. You guys should be familiar with this. This is your classic equilibrium table. Equilibrium, this is 75 over Vt minus x. This is x, this is 25 over vt plus x, OK? Our mass action expression will look like this. Notice we're forming hydronium, so it's a Ka. Products, overreactant. You know, we got to do self for X. Now, we haven't covered this in lecture yet. Okay. What you're, what is going to end up happening is that the X is going to be small compared to that. The X is going to be small compared to that. So this simplifies to X 20 times 25 over VT all over 75 minus 
um, divided by Vt. Why? Because we can assume that this x value here is small compared to that. Why can we make that assumption? This is a weak acid. Weak acids are going to have small Ka's. So you can make that assumption. And then you're going to say that this is small compared to that. So it simplifies to this. Let me share with you even a, a bigger secret. We haven't talked about the henderson hasselbach equation yet, but when we do, this is the equation that you will see, pH equals pKa plus the log of your conjugate base over your conjugate acid. Once you have common ions in the solution, hey, look, common ions in the solution, then you can use this equation. Okay, it's called the common ion effect. Common ion effect is buffers. You can use this equation. So what can we do here? We can, we know what the Ka value is because we know what the, the um, identity of the acid is. So if we take the negative log of that, then we can get the pKa. And then if we know the concentration of the base and the concentration of the acid, which is just this, this is 25 over Vt, this is 75 over Vt, but the, vol but the total volume are the same. So this is really just 25 over 75 log, because the volumes are gonna cancel out each other. We can use this equation directly. It's called the henderson hasselbach equation. And we can use this equation once we start adding titrant and we start forming its conjugate. So from this point all the way to right before it reached the equivalent point, that's the buffer region. This is called the buffer region. And if you have the buffer region, use the henderson hasselbach equation. Remember that this point right here, that's weak acid calculation. Weak acid calculation. Let me show you an important um, eureka about buffers. Let's say you do your titration and right here, you're doing your titration and you've now converted half of your acid to its conjugate. So let's do this, HA plus hydroxide. We started out with 100 moles of this. And let's say we, we convert only half of it, 50. OK, so that's our S. This is our R. This is our F. So what happens is that half of this is going to react. So minus 50, minus 50. But our conjugate here, that would be plus 50. So our acid and our conjugate are going to be same amount in solution. 100 minus 50 is 50. 0 plus 50 is 50. When we stick this into the henderson hasselbach equation, CB stands for conjugate base. That's what CB stands for. This is the conjugate base right there. CA stands for conjugate acid. This is the conjugate acid right there. Okay, that's conjugate acid right there. So, Look what happens when you reach the halfway to the equivalence point. Halfway to the equivalence point, we're not at the equivalence point. I got to make that clear. The equivalence point is when the moles of your acid and the moles of the base are equal. We are only halfway because we're only reacting half of the acid with the base. Only half of it is going to react. OK? So what happens is that these two are equal. When these two are equal, the log of 
20 over 20. 20 over 20 is one, the log of one is zero. The log of one equals zero because this might, this is, they're equal, okay? So the pH equals your pKa. So in a weak acid, strong base titration, if this is the equivalence point over here, and let's say the equivalence point is here, then halfway to that equivalence point right here, that pH is equal to the pKa, okay? That's a point you should always get. That, that's free points for any test. pH equals your pKa halfway to the equivalence point, not at the equivalence point, because the equivalence point means that these two are equal, and so you don't have any acid left. Everything has converted to its conjugate. So if you don't, if everything's being converted to the conjugate, then that means this, this chemical right here is zero, and anything over zero is undefined. So it's not the equivalence point. It's halfway to the equivalence point, halfway to the equivalence point. So right here, this is the equivalence point, OK? Halfway to that, pH equals pKa. You want to use the henderson hasselbalch equation from this point, this area, because that's the buffer. But when you're halfway to the equivalence point, you don't even use, use the henderson hasselbalch equation. You know that pH equals pKa. Now let's suppose we get to the equivalence point. Okay, let's suppose we get to the equivalence point. Well, at the equivalence point, this is what happens. You still have your acid. You got your hydroxide, and now they're equal. They, they are equal. So again, we have to do SRF. We have 100 here. We have 100 here. And then this is going to form water, and this is going to form the conjugate. At the equivalence point, these two are equal. OK? So minus 100, and we're talking about moles, moles. You need to divide by the total volume. The volume is constantly changing, so you got to keep track of that. But these guys will convert over to the conjugate. So at the equivalence point, this is 0, this is 0, but this is all of this moles have converted over to its conjugate base, all of it. The concentration is not going to be the same because the volume is changing. Okay? But uh, if you have the moles and you divide by the total volume, the total volume is whatever volume you have of your, your analyte. It's the chemical you're analyzing plus the volume that you've added from your titrant. Then you've got this. So this is just the moles over the total volume. And in your solution, That's what you have. You don't have the acid anymore. Why don't you have the acid? Because it's been neutralized by the base. All of this is gone. All of that is gone, as well as the hydroxide is gone. All you got is the conjugate. But the conjugate is a weak base of a weak acid. I mean, the conjugate is the base of a weak acid. That means there's chemistry to be had. A minus plus water will do this. That's a KB. Why is it a KB? Because you're forming hydroxide. This is what we call hydrolysis. And you know how to solve this, OK? It's basically the same as a weak acid, except now we're doing the base. The hydroxide ion concentration is equal to the square root of the KB times the conjugate acid concentration. Don't bother with the ice table. Just go straight to this. That's the way I teach it in my analytical chemistry course. OK? Why? Again, you got to remember. That's why I'm trying to draw you a picture so you can visualize the chemistry that occurs. Because the chemistry is going to dictate the math that you are using. OK? The chemistry is going to dictate the math that you are using. This part right here at the equivalence point, it's not 7 because this conjugate is going to react with water in a process called hydrolysis. Whenever something reacts with water, we call it hydrolysis. And it's going to reform that acid. 
Now, it's not a buffer either, okay? It's not a buffer either. What happens is a, it's a weak base, weak base calculation. And in a weak base calculation, we can use that. Remember the equations that I showed you. H3O plus is equal to the square root of the um, Ka times the acid initial concentration, hydroxide ion concentration, oops, yeah, is equal to the Kb times the concentration of the conjugate base initial. And then we also remember that um, pH plus pOH equals pKw, and that pKa um, plus pKb equals pKw. These are equations that you guys are going to be using, so get used to it. So this is an equivalence point. You use this. So let's go back up here. At this equivalence point right here, okay, at that equivalence point right there, what we're going to do is we're going to say that the hydroxide ion concentration is equal to the square root of the Kb times the concentration of the conjugate. See how we use hydronium ion concentration here? For that point, we're using hydroxide ion concentration for that point. Now we get past the equivalence point. Past the equivalence point, this is again what happens. We got our acid, we got our base, we're going to form the conjugate and water. Let's say that we now have 125 of this and this is 100. Again, it's still SRF because whenever you have a strong base, it's always stoichiometric. So our limiting reagent now is the acid. And then the reaction is this, 0, 20, 125 minus 100 is 25, and this will be a 100. But this is a weak base. This is a weak base. And because it's a weak base, that A minus will surely give you hydroxide, but not very high. Not very, not a lot of base is going to be generated from that conjugate base because it's a weak base. This, however, is a strong base. In the presence of a weak base, if you have a strong base and a weak base, or a strong acid and a weak acid, the strong is always going to dominate. It's going to overshadow the weak. So all you really need to do is figure out the concentration of that excess. to get the hydroxide ion concentration and take the negative log of that to get your pOH. You don't even have to worry about this contribution right there because it's coming from a weak base. Yeah, it's going to add some, but it's negligible. All you have to do is calculate the excess hydroxide that went unreacted, figure out that concentration, and then you will get these points over here. This is excess hydroxide. Okay. So let's try a problem. Let's try a problem. The problem I'm going to do is the one that I have in my lecture uh, notes. It's going to be KOH. So let me uh, show you that real quick. This one right here case study, okay? Um, I'm going to be writing on this real quick. So here it is again. When you have a weak acid titrated with a strong base, we have four regions. This is the weak acid calculation. That's an equilibrium. 
This is a buffer. That's the Henderson Hasselbach equation. At the equivalence point, that's hydrolysis. Hydrolysis. That's a weak base calculation. And then over here, where you have excess base, um, that's just stoichiometry. Four types of calculation. And you guys know how to solve these problems because we've already covered it in lecture, or you have that knowledge. So those are the four types. Analyte alone, weak acid. Buffer region, because you're forming conjugate pairs. Once you add the base, you're forming its conjugate. That's a buffer. Equivalence point, all the acids converted to its conjugate. That conjugate is now the base. It's going to be a weak base calculation. It's a KB calculation. And then stoichiometry, whatever excess hydroxide you have, OK? So that, this is basically it. So this is the problem that I have. Hypochlorous acid, HOCl, is going to be titrated with um, KOH. Let me forewarn you, especially for those of you in my lecture. If I don't give you KOH, I give you CaOH2. Then remember, if, if the concentration is 0.4, then your hydroxide ion concentration is 0.8. Why? Because for every one calcium hydroxide, you have two hydroxide. Look at the chemistry. Don't just assume that because I give you 0.4, that the hydroxide ion concentration is 0.4. Look at the chemistry. Calcium hydroxide has two hydroxides for every one calcium hydroxide. Please remember that, OK? Because that's one of the ways I kind of gauge whether or not you guys are paying attention to the fundamentals. Because this is a fundamental. This is a fundamental. OK? So um, we've got 10 mils of 0.4 molar hypochlorous acid. This is hypochlorous acid. And we need to figure out what the pH values are at 0%, 50%, 95%, 100%, and 105%. Okay, so the first thing that we need is we need to figure out, okay, we've got hypochlorous acid. Um, what is the Ka? You can look that up. If you know the Ka, then you've got this data point right there, 50%. Because all you got to do is take the negative log of your Ka, and you've got the pKa, and at 50%, pH equals pKa. Not at the equivalence point, but halfway to the equivalence point. I need to remind you time and time again, because as many times as I say that, a lot of you are just going to assume, OK, the, at the equivalence point, pH equals pK. No, no, no. OK, halfway, halfway. Because according to the henderson hasselbach equation, the numerator and the denominator are equal. So that log term goes to 0 pH equals pKa, OK? So um, the other thing that you need to do is, let me clear this. You need to figure out what volumes of um, potassium hydroxide you're going to be using, because I don't tell you that volume. I tell you that it's 100% of the, excuse me, equivalence point, 95% the equivalence point, 50% the equivalence point, 0%. 0% is just no titrant, OK? This is my concentration of my base. This is the concentration of my acid. They're the same. And they're both monobasic and monoprotic. So I know that if the concentration are the same, then the equivalence point is going to be reached when I have equal volumes of potassium hydroxide with the volume of hypochlorous acid I started with. And I'm using 10 mils of hypochlorous acid. Now, if this was calcium hydroxide and I've got 0.4, this will be 0.8. And so what will happen is that um, I'm going to reach the equivalence point at 5 mils, because 5 mils 
times 0.8 equals 10 mils times 0.4. Remember, you have twice as many hydroxide in calcium hydroxide. So you need half the volume. You need half the volume. Anyway, I keep alluding to that because those are typical questions I usually ask in the midterm or exams where I give you a dye basic chemicals and a lot of you will forget, oh, there's a chemistry involved. That thing can spit out two hydroxide because of the formula. Always pay attention to the chemistry. Don't just assume that you're going to use that number. Look at the chemicals you're dealing with. Anyway, in this particular case, it is monobasic, which means that at 10 mils, that's when I hit my equivalent volume. At five mils, that's where we, we reach the halfway point. So this right here, 50% is five mils. 100% is 10 mils. 95% is 9.5 mils. Uh, 105 is 10.5 mils. You just take the percentage and multiply it by 10 because 10 would be 100%. So 95% times 10 would be 9.5. Okay, it's just, it's just math. So now I know the volumes. I need to figure out the pH. So these are the volumes. And I need to calculate the pH at 0, 5, 9.5, 10, and 10.5 milliliters. That's what I need to do. This I already have. This I already have. Um, let me just see. Yeah, here. Okay. The pKa of hypochlorous acid or the K of hypochlorous acid is three times 10 to the eight, minus eight. So the pKa is 7.5. So this right here, oops, is 7.5. I've got that point right there. Okay. Um, so the Ka is three times 10 to the minus eight. Ka equals three times 10 to the minus eight. Okay, so at zero, look at this, look at this. Okay, let me show you how easy this is. Let me raise this so I can have some space. Okay, the hydronium ion concentration is equal to the Ka, uh, what did we say it was? Three times 10 to the minus eight times the concentration of our acid 0.4. That's my hydronium ion concentration. I'm just going to use that equation where I take the Ka multiplied by the concentration of the acid and take the square root of that. And that's essentially what, what I do right here. Okay, this is my first point. I take my um, Ka, 3 times 10 to the minus 8, multiply it by 0.4, because that's the concentration of hypochloric acid is this. And I get my hydronium ion concentration right here. And I just need, need to take the negative log of that. That's my second point, 3.9. No, that's my first point, sorry. That's my first point, 3.96. Right here, 3.96. The equivalence point, the halfway to the equivalence point, 7.5. So that, that'll be that point right there. See? You don't even have to think. You don't even have to think. Now at, the, at 95%, which is the next problem, okay, 95%, which is the next problem right here. Oops, 95%. That's a buffer problem. That's a buffer problem. First thing you need to do is you need to figure out how many moles of acid you have, how many moles of base you're introducing. At 95%, that's 3.8 moles. Take 0.4, multiply by 95, that's 3.8. So what happens is that 3.8 is the limiting. You're going to form 3.8 of the conjugate. So at the finish, we've got 0.2 moles of the acid that was unreacted, 3.8 moles of the conjugate base that is produced. What's the volume now? We started out with 10 milliliters. 
and we've introduced 9.5 milliliters from our patient, so our total volume is 19.5. But we don't even need the volume when we do the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, because according to the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, why are we using the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation? Because we are in the buffer region. The pH equals the pKa, which we said was 7.5 plus the log of the conjugate base, it's going to be uh, 3.8 over 19.5 over 0.2 over 19.5. You see why we don't need the volume? They cancel out. So it's just 3.8 over 0.2. And that ratio right there, the log of that is 1.28. So we add 1.28 to 7.5, we get 8.58. That is the pH at the 95% of the equivalence point, 95%, which is 9.5 milliliters. 9.5 milliliters is going to give us a pH of 8.78. Now, the next step is the equivalence point. Equivalence point, all of this is now converted to that 0.4 millimoles in 20 milliliters has been converted to this. Guess what? Hydroxide equals Kb times whatever that concentration is. That'll be our hydroxide ion concentration. Now if we take the negative log of that, we get our pOH. Subtract 14 from our pOH, we got a pH. And that's what you see right here at 100%, okay? All of this converts over to this. And this is nothing more than that. Now, how do we calculate our Kb? Well, remember that our Ka was 3 times 10 to the minus 8. Right there. Ka times Kb equals Kw. Because you got to use a Kb in this particular case. Why? Because you're forming a base. You're forming a base. It just use this equation. It'll get you to this answer. I know it's a tedious problem, but if you approach it one step at a time and you know each step, it's not difficult. It's not. Give you, write yourself a cheat sheet so you know, okay, I'm in the weak acid situation. I didn't add any titrant. Oh, I'm in the buffer situation because I've got a common ion present. Oh, all my acid has been neutralized. So the conjugate base is now the chemical present in solution. That's hydrolysis. That's a KB problem. And then the very last step is excess base. Excess base. So I'm at 105%. Here's my potassium hydroxide. This is my acid. I add 4.2 millimoles. Why am I using millimoles? Okay, you're probably asking, why am I using millimoles? Because if you have a millimole, and a millimoles 10 to the minus three moles, and you divide it by a milliliter, guess what? You've got molarity. If you've got a moles and you divide it by a milliliter, then you're going to get a number 10 to the minus three. So in acid-base chemistry, what we do is we just work with millimoles. It makes life so much easier, okay? So let's get to this last part. We have excess base in a tune of of 0.2 that went unreacted. If we know we have 0.2 millimoles of hydroxide unreacted, and I know my total volume, what is my total volume? 10 of my acid plus 10.5 of my base that we ate reacted, that's 20.5. So my total volume is 20.5 milliliters. That now is a concentration of my hydroxide. If I take the negative log of that, and I think this is what you see right here. Okay, if I take the negative log of that, then I will get um, 2.01, subtract 14 from that, I get 
this right here just goes to show you that the amount of hydroxide this guy contributes. So this is the calculation for how much hydroxide this guy contributes because we ignore that when we did this calculation. Look at the, the amount that we, we um, calculate. The amount of hydroxide OCL con contributed is um, 6.64 times 10 to the minus 6. The amount of hydroxide excess was 9.76 times 10 to the minus 3. That's three orders of magnitude. That's why you could ignore it. That's probably the simplest way in terms of making streamlining these problems. Okay, and now we have our last point right here at, for that. Let me clear this. And then all you got to do is connect the dots. We got this dot, we got this dot, we got this dot, and we got um, this dot over here. And it's always going to look like this. Don't ever write a titration curve that is a straight line. Okay, don't ever do that. Or don't ever do this. Don't ever do this. Um, like that. Make it a curve because that's a titration. So this right here is a summary of, of what we just talked about. This is a summary. This is for the weak acid situation. That's this point right here. This is your buffer situation. That is this point right here. From when you start to add titrant to right before the equivalence point, it's a buffer. This is when all your acid has converted to its conjugate. That's the equivalence point. That's this right here. And this is the excess. That's this right here. So you can distill it down to these basic four equations. And if you know how to solve titration problems using these four equations, then you don't really need to do much, but understand the fundamentals. That's why it took time. That's why this lecture is going longer than usual, because I want you to see the dynamics that happens when you're doing a titration, how initially you just have the acid, and then when you add base, you're forming both the acid and its conjugate. So that's a buffer. When you reach the equivalent point, all the acid now converts over to its conjugate. So that's a base problem. And then when you add excess base, the, in the presence of a strong base and a weak base, the strong base is going to dominate. Okay, The pH is going to be determined by that strong base. And that's what happens at, this, at the very last point. So try to work on the activity while it's still fresh in your mind. Maybe you guys have plans for this evening, but if, if you don't, try and work on the activity while it's still fresh in your mind and see if you can't do the first one. You should be able to easily get the uh, weak acid strong base titration, because we just talked about that. You should be able to get the strong acid strong base titration because that's stuff that we did. It's up to you to learn how to do the strong, the weak base, strong acid situation. That's um, the situation when we have this, okay? Um, we have this. So what, what's going to happen is your analyte is a base, and your titrant is a strong acid. So you're gonna start, remember it's always the pH versus the volume of titrant. So because this is a base, your pH is going to be high. It's gonna be around 10, uh, 11, 12. And then it's going to drop. And this is still a buffer. Okay, that's still a buffer. The buffer for a base is the following, pOH equals pKa, pKb I mean, plus the log of the acid over the base. When we have the pH equals pKa plus the log of the base over the acid, 
Well, when we're calculating pOH, it's the acid over the base. You reverse that too. So that's this region right here. And then this equivalence point right there, this is a calculation for a weak acid, weak acid calculation. And then past the equivalence point, excess acid calculation. But your titration curve is going to look like this. It's going to drop. You're going to reach the equivalence point, and then it's going to level off. OK? I think you have one problem that is like that. So try that, OK? Um, so Wednesday, I'm not going to be talking. Uh, you guys can just log in between 6.30 and 8 o'clock. Try not to log in any later than that and take the quiz. It's only 75 points. Uh, it's two hours. You can use your lecture notes. You can use your lab manual. You can look at your canvas. Just don't look at the internet for the answers, OK? Um, and then that's what we have scheduled for, for Wednesday. And then I'll release your, your um, report, experiment three, and your feedback for experiment two. And that's it. I hope uh, that made sense, OK? I hope that made sense, because it's not difficult, but it is very confusing because there's so many moving parts. All right. Thank you very much. And you guys have a good evening.